Okay, well, hello, viewers and listeners. Ta -da. The curtains have been drawn back. We are revealed. So Samir is on his phone tonight, so his audio is a little bit echoey, but it uh, should be all right. And that's due to the fact that well, you've got no internet and stuff there, have you, at the moment? No, we've got, we are basically uh, offline, and uh, we've been offline for a few days, hopefully back uh, middle of next week, and it's 4,000 houses. Unbelievable. I mean, that is a shocking amount of houses to be out for, well, since Wednesday, Thursday in a week. You'd think that that would be prioritised, wouldn't you? I mean, that's amazing. Yes. What it, what it is, it's a uh, uh, fibre optics, they need a special machinery. They've got some bits done and other bits they need to get special machinery from somewhere. Hmm. So, you know, hopefully I'll be back next week on the big screen. Okay. Right, well, I'll let viewers know what move, well, viewers will know what move. I always think that this is kind of like a big reveal or something, but it's not, is it? I mean, it's been, it's been publicised that we're reviewing the 13th Warrior tonight. For like yes. a week, so I don't know why I feel the, the fucking need to. Anyway, I by jabbing. the way, oh. is that better? Yeah, yeah, that sound is much better. It is for me anyway, so hopefully it will be for the viewers and listeners too. So, right, I'm going to read this the um, synopsis on this briefly. Thirteenth Warrior, released in 1999. A man having fallen in love with the wrong woman is sent by the Sultan himself on a dipl diplomatic mission to distant land as an ambassador stopping at a viking village port to restock on supplies he finds himself unwittingly embroiled in a quest to banish a mysterious threat in a distant viking land now i have to admit right some of that i don't even remember being part of the film right having fallen in love with the wrong woman that is briefly glossed over right at the beginning of this film yes i think if the yes I think if they had done that, it would have been a quite a long story. I think that's why they just... Uh, yeah, went, I yeah. Think the, the editing and whatnot, just, yeah, I can understand that. But it was so brief. I mean, you, you just see this woman, um, and yeah. they catch eye contact, and that's it. That's all you but, see. And then, and then all of a sudden he's fucking banished. I had no idea that was the Sultan either. No idea. It was just some important <coughs> guy. That wasn't explained. And it wasn't a diplomatic mission, to my knowledge. It was just like sent off, like oh, you're you're an ambassador now, you know, get out, get out of the royal court, um, and fuck off. Um, I didn't know there was a mission behind it. Yeah, I think it was a diplomatic mission, but the way it was done was basically uh, you fell in love with this important man's wife, and he looked at her so piss off from me, go away. Yeah, but it was it they, was just wrapped up in a uh, that sort of. Position. Yeah, because they were walking across the desert. They were chased by what looked like, what looked like Mongols. Yes. And then the Mongols backed off once they reached this river, and then they just happened to stumble upon some Vikings. And it was like, oh, let's go and talk to these guys then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's just uh, let's just talk to these guys then. Oh, yeah. okay. And then uh, then the story started. And another thing I found strange was. Uh... His father's friend was the only one who stayed behind. What happened to the other guys who uh, rode with him? Did they just go back to Arabia or Baghdad or wherever? Yeah. Very good point, yeah. Huh. They just all stayed there and got pissed up and converted to being pagans, I suppose. Who knows? Bizarre. I mean, the old fella, the old fella played, played by Omar Sharif. Yes. He just disappeared. He was the only, only translator there as well. So yes, he, he was, just sent yeah. this guy off, couldn't speak a fucking word of... Norwegian or Danish or whatever they were, Swedish. So oh, you, you, you'll be all right, mate. You'll figure it out. Fucking hell. And the funny thing was, around the fire, he did figure it out so fast. Yeah, just by <laughs> listening. Yeah, and that doesn't work. No. If you just if you, if you just listen to Italian, if you just listen to Spanish with no other context, what? How are you supposed to learn that? Fucking bizarre. You must have good uh, uh, sort of hearing, first of all, and very good at lip, lip reading because that's how he basically learned. Yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. I wish I could learn a language like that. Yeah, I would because I'd try and learn every language possible if it was that, right. if it was that easy. Yeah. So cast. Let's briefly go over the cast here. Antonio Banderas plays Ahmed Ibn Fadalan. Fadal um, who the hell was Queen Valo? 
played by Diane Venora. Wasn't she the dark head lady uh, who was guiding them all the time? Come here, I'll, I'll take you to. Uh, I think it was yes. her. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Dennis Store Hoy as Herga, the joyous. Uh, Vladimir Kulich, who played Bully Wolf, the leader. Omar Sharif, we've mentioned, he played uh, Milshtek. Yep. Uh, he was the the older, kind of wiser fella that did all the interpretation. Um, Anders T. Anderson uh, played uh, Vigleaf, King's son. There's a few other noticeable faces in this as well, recognisable faces. Uh, Clive Russell, uh, an English actor, and uh, Tony Curran. Was there a Scottish Pure... actor in there as well? I've seen that was that's Tony Curran. Yeah. Okay. There's in quite a few films like that, isn't he? I think he's in Braveheart as well, I think, and or Robert Roy Roy what is it called? Robert Roy Rob or Roy. whatever. Rob Roy, Rob that's Roy. it. Yeah, so there's a there's a, a few actors in this that you recognise just sort of from from other little yeah. cameo and bit part roles. Um because this was based on a book by Michael Crichton. Crichton? Yeah. Crichton. I don't know how you pronounce that name now. The Some guy called wrote, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was the one that wrote Jurassic Park. Really? Uh, yeah. And then um, this was directed by John McTiernan, of course, of diehard oh. fame. A very, very well respected action movie director of John McTiernan. Um, and he was also a co producer with Michael Crichton or Michael Crichton, however you pronounce that. So <laughs> the two of them put their money into this. And as we mentioned my man, before, yeah, before we before we <laughs> started talking about this and recording it live, um, this is the biggest ever flop in the box office. This ranks number one still from nineteen ninety nine. I'm very surprised because um, I had, uh, the, I've seen it two or three times, and I have to say I did enjoy, really enjoy it the first few times I watched it. And that's why when he mentioned it, I, I was very shocked. Uh, but I understand, and I'll say that later on in in, in the sort of first show. And mm. uh, yeah, I was going to say something to you before this, but I completely forgot what I was going to say. But never mind, I'll come back to it. Okay, uh, you remember it? Yeah, we'll come back to it. So 160 million was put into this. And on its opening weekend in the in America and Canada, it made just over ten million dollars. Had a good and, start, <laughs> yeah. And uh, gross worldwide, uh, sixty-one million. Okay. Hmm. So, now I remember. Uh, now you've mentioned the figures. Now I know what I was going to say. Um, the actual book was a mixture of um, English. Uh, sort of folklore tales with is it Beowulf or his name is Beowulf, yeah, Beowulf, Saxon story, uh, yeah. stories, and uh, Ijim Amid or whatever his name was, uh, the the guy Antonio uh, Banderas plays was actually a tr- real, real life traveler. And uh, when they wrote the book, it was a combination of uh, folklore and an actual journey by him. And right. that's why you see the right him writing the story at the towards the end uh, of the because it's meant to be based on that or on fictional terms. But that's what Michael, whatever, uh, basically based his <laughs> book on. So it's a mix of fact and fiction. Right. Okay. Okay. Um. Overall, it was just it was boring. And it was um, the the first action sequence that we get to in this after some quite lengthy dialogue and and character. Well, I say character building. I didn't feel anything for any of the characters in this film. I just didn't care. Um, but the first action scene was all shot in the dark. You could barely see what the fuck was going on. I was squinting at it at the TV. Yeah. Uh, so what? Um, I guess they were trying to go for a lot of atmosphere. Yes. Um, but it fell flat, in my opinion. It was um, it was not great. And I'd, I, why did they choose Antonio Banderas to play? Not that he did a bad job, by the way. But 
Uh, there was no Arab actors in uh, uh, in Hollywood at the time. Oh, maybe, maybe. I, I don't know. I, that's the funny thing. You wouldn't get away with it now. I don't think you would. No, I think you're right. I think the um, yeah, the PC brigade would be after you. Yeah, I mean, how can I say? Even having someone of Indian origin or whatever try to play an Arab wouldn't be allowed, mate. Although. You could get away with it. I mean, Antonio Banderas got away with it because of his uh, Spanish tan. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's not been a racial thing, but I think that's why he was picked, because he was a big name at the time in Hollywood. He had two or three massive hits, I think, before that, uh, that to, like, one after the other. And that's why I think he got the part. But... Yeah, I don't know why he was playing that Arab when he's obviously Spanish. Mm. Yeah. He was born in Malaga. Found that out today. Malaga's a famous British destination. It's like pissed up holidays wearing your Union Jack shorts. Yeah, I think that's why he <laughs> wanted to leave the place, mate. I think yeah. it was that. <laughs> I won't uh, blame him. Yeah, no. I won't want to live there. Get out. No. Um, was there anything good in this film? Okay, uh, how can I say? I'm gonna say something. It's really, I want to really say something, but okay, I really enjoyed it the first time I watched it. And why was that? You know, it was, I don't know, I love them sort of Viking movies, I don't know what it is, but I really like, you know, yesterday I was saying to yesterday, last week, I was saying to uh, it feels like yesterday that I love uh, Viking movies, I don't know what it is, it's just. You take it out of the real world. That's why I don't like some of these modern action movies because you are living in your own time sometimes or whatever the case is. And I don't want to do that. I want to really get going, get into my imagination and wonder how it was in those days when someone from maybe, let's say, the subcontinent may have come along or from uh, the uh, Arabias or the Middle East, whatever uh, they were called, or, you know, and they came to the northern parts of Europe, like maybe Britain or going to Scandinavia. And can you imagine some six foot six, tall, blonde, blue eyed, whatever the, they sort of described the old Vikings as, facing this person from um, minor Asia, who's, as you know, Asian people are not very tall, at five, five or five, six, and looking at him going, Bloody, I've never seen a guy who's tanned. Uh, sort of thing. Where is he from? And then you don't know each other's language. And obviously one of them knew how to speak Greek or Latin, whatever it was. So that helped. But yeah, it would have been a strange and unusual experience because people didn't travel. Only ambassadors did or yeah. high commissions or whatever. And that's what fascinates me. It takes me back how people would have reacted to each other. Um it's not like now we pop onto a plane and then we go to, for example, or fly to wherever, and people know where you're from. Yeah, we know so much about the world now. Right? Yeah. Then it would have been really quite magical, I suppose. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, can you imagine like a person from Africa being taken yes. to somewhere like Norway? Because exactly. I mean, the Vikings were big into the old slave trade at the time as well. They were raiding yes. and capturing pillagers' slaves. So. The first time that a person from Africa or something ended up there must have been like, wow, look at this. I mean, it's good. <laughs> wow, look yeah. at this guy. What the fuck? This is amazing. So, yeah, I can imagine that. And, I, you know, I like the whole Viking stuff in general. I agree with you on that. But I didn't feel like this movie was about Vikings. It just, they could have been any, it could, you could have interchanged all of the actors, all of the, yeah. you could have swapped them around for whatever flavour you fancied. Because yeah. there was no, there was no sort of world building in this film no. at all. No, well, I certainly didn't feel that anyway. Um, and and the music, this is one of the things that really got me with it. Is um, the Northman that we watched last weekend? You had the Viking style music going. You had the Viking style kind of pagan religion stuff being played out and stuff. And you, it was building uh, an environment, a world. Uh, a, like a universe around, you know, this is Viking. This is what they did. And it yes. tried to portray that. Whereas this, it was, apart from the seer that came into the tent 
at the very beginning. I didn't feel that there was anything particularly like in the soundtrack, as I mentioned, but it was like this generic theatrical score that could have played out in, in most movies. Oh. There was a little bit of, of that. There was, a, I, I guess, it could have been Middle Eastern, I suppose. Yeah, that was the but, only bit of the music I thought was okay or nice uh, in a sense of describing the person's background. But you're right, the other stuff was like typical action movie music. Yeah. Um, if they had done that across the movie generally, I think it would have been much better. And again, it was not only character building, but the story building was weak as well. You would think something's yes. going to happen and they would never build on it. Yeah, I can't... Well, I mean, the bit where they go and take that cave by yeah. force, um, that was interesting. Yes. Who were these people? But we never got to find out. They were just no. mysterious people, mysterious. And, and that was it. There was no delving into why they were doing what they were doing. There was no delving mm. into the fact there was fucking hundreds of them as well. I mean, that was another yeah. thing. The insurmountable <laughs> odds. There was yeah. fucking hundreds of them queuing up outside that little village. Yes. And that, the- that village would have been obliterated, mate. There's no fucking way they would have survived that. And not only that, they disappeared once they killed them. They just disappeared. And the amazing yeah. thing was the ending of the movie as well. They just fucks off back home. You know why, don't you? Because Beowulf, you know, there's a, uh, you can kill the witch, the lead, the lady uh, who was, he chopped Beowulf. But Beowulf, in di- when he died, they disappeared. So they said, when you destroy their leader. So indirectly, he was their leader. Because the moment he dies, they disappear. And if you notice, they don't only go, they die, they fall down and die. Well, one, you know? one of them, I think it's portrayed that one of them had sort of serious injuries. And as he was riding off, he just fell off his horse and died. And the rest of them just kind of whimpered off. But yeah, the bit where they killed the leader of them and he was slain and they all just fucked off. That's like video game mentality, yeah. that is. Yeah, you no. all a swarm, you kill the leader and then all of a sudden you've won the level. It's yeah, pathetic. so... So basically, they went off, but the guy who fell falls down was the first one to get the uh, side effect of the leader dying. It was something that the leader had so much power that di- all of them died because if you look oh, careful, you think... yeah, because right. that's okay. what I saw in the distance. If you look at all of them, were starting to fall, uh, fall down like they were dying and disappearing. Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah, that was in the end. That's how interested you were afterwards. <laughs> I saw the first. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I saw the first guy fall off his horse, and I thought he'd just like sustained an injury in bat when you know, just like ugh, fell off his horse and died. Um, yeah. I didn't realize they were all yeah. dying, so yeah, right, but, okay. So they wanted to take revenge after the, the, the witch or whatever her name was killed, yeah. uh, sort of thing. But that was a uh, meant to be the surprise element, was it was Beowulf who was the bloody leader, and when he dies, uh, they disappear like magic they start collapsing and then when the fog or mist goes away all of them are gone sort of thing mm-hmm. and you think bloody hell that's end for end of it for generations to come they say in the end sort of thing before the ending it, in the funeral who played that that witch character who played because i thought she was a little bit you know a little bit interesting a little bit sexy that bird <laughs> yeah uh, I have to say, yeah, I have to agree with you. I felt the same. Well, yeah, dangerous, isn't it? Yeah, this dangerous, yeah. crazy bitch. You know, is collecting human skulls and stuff, and got snakes wrapped around her. She's like almost naked. You're like, oh hello, you know? Do I want to kill her? Or do I want to, you know? <laughs> I thought you were going to take a cigarette out and took a seat out and say, "My name is Bond, James Bond." <laughs> yeah, she just, looked, you know, she just looked dangerous and kind of intrigued. yeah, she did. Like, mm, I wouldn't be in a rush to kill her. I don't think I'd want to interrogate her or something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I was struggling to to think about what else I could say about this film. Really, it might be the shortest movie review we've ever done. Um, I mean, the, the characters, the, the actors themselves, I suppose that the Antonio Banderas was probably that he was obviously the major star in this and carried most yeah. of the movie. I felt he played quite well. The the other one of the Vikings that was there for sort of comedic effect, the one that. Was, Talking to him and kept calling, uh, little like, little calling, man. yeah, little brother, little brother. Little um, uh, I mean, uh, we've seen it before, haven't we? 
No. You know, the sort of the, the, the whole That's... dynamic of that relationship is. It's done so many times by Hollywood, hasn't it? Really? Yeah. I mean, obviously, it started off as a book first, so it's obviously been done so many times in books as well. It's just that yeah. a lot of us don't read many books anymore. So, no. all right, you're probably about a chapter in on this book. You'd be like, "Fuck you, know, Michael. You know, you got anything else, mate? You know, Jurassic yeah. Park Two. Have you got that wrote yet? I'd rather read that." <laughs> well, if you think about that franchise, basically, uh, that's flopped. Started flopping. The, the it was only the first movie, or se- first and second movie, I think, were successful. I think after that has been flop after flop. Um, I'm not sure. I, I know the the more recent ones with Bryce Dallas Howard and Chris <coughs> Pratt. I think they've done reasonably well at the box office. That's why they keep making them. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what the most recent one, the new one that's coming out fairly soon, Dominion. Yeah. Be interesting to see what that does. But um, they're sort of switch the brain off type yeah. movies. They're just pure. Oh look, big dinosaur! And there's another wow. bigger dinosaur. Yeah. There's another bigger dinosaur. Yeah. I tell you <laughs> another interesting fact I read about this book. Um, as you know, Omar Sharif actually is a legendary uh, actor, massive in the sixties. Uh, did things like legendary films like the movie I always say we need to do one day, Lawrence of Arabia, and uh, things like that. Uh, he said the experience tormented him so much, he goes, he did it for the pay. He goes, I'll never do a bloody shit like this again in my life for money. Enough's enough. And he re- uh, retired after this for a few years. Uh, I think he retired All for right. three years, then came back and did a really interesting call. Uh, Mr. Abraham, uh, which was a story about a Jewish boy be- becoming friends with a Muslim uh, neighbour in France or Paris. And he goes, until that day, he didn't make a movie, till that movie, because for three years he thought, oh, my God, because I've, I've done enough uh, to survive and make shit movies like this. He said it was hmm. one of the shittest things he's ever done in his life. Well, I'm just... As you were talking, I was just kind of scanning over some of the trivia on this movie. Um, and it was about the musical score, actually. Yeah. A guy called Graham Ravel had composed a complete original score when the movie was slated to be released as Eaters of the Dead in 1998. Yeah. After the film was deemed unwatchable during test screening, unwatchable during test screenings, Michael Crichton took over the project, rejected Ravel's original score, and brought in Jerry Goldsmith to rescore the film named The Thirteenth Warrior. <coughs> so Crichton came in and took over the project. And he fucked it up a little bit more. Sorry, am I allowed to say, <laughs> say that? <laughs> yeah, you can it's... say what you want. You know, so this he... is the... go, yeah, go ahead. Go, go ahead. All right, so oh. that's another trivia piece that I thought might be interesting. As in accordance with the book, John McTiernan's version of the, of the Wendell's mother was an old woman played by veteran actress Susan Willis. When Michael Crichton took over and did the reshoots, <laughs> he decided that brutally killing off an old lady did not reflect very well on the heroes. Crichton decided to make her younger, sleeker and tougher. In the final release, Wendell's mother is played by Kirsten Cloak. Oh, she's an uncredited. That's why we can't find her in the list. So Kirsten Cloak. Mm-hmm. But the final credits still list Susan Willis as the Windows mother. And we never yeah. see Susan. No. Susan's not there. Kristen Cloak. Kristen Cloak was born September 2nd in Van Nuys, California. I probably said that wrong. Uh, she attended California State University. Her first feature film role was the female lead in Megaville 1990, opposite Billy Zane. She is best known from her role as Shane Vance in the television series Space Above and Beyond. So not a massive pedigree Stop. of acting. Mm. No. Still, there you go. I feel like we've done her some justice, though, actually mentioning her being in this film yeah. as the sexy witch at the end. Another thing is, uh, yeah, sexy witch, brilliant. And um, what else? You know when you spend so much money and you know that the first time you've done a cut and the audience find it boring and you have to redo it, sometimes you just need to say, yeah, wash your hands off the project and say, yeah, we've lost 60 million, put it on the shelves in the film 10 
and let it be part of history and one day someone might find their film and might say, okay, that looks interesting. But 90% of the time when people do that, when they have to do cuts, it's 90% of the time it's a flop. Yeah. Even after the cuts, and this is a mistake, there was so much potential, I think, in this film that they could have, for example, they could have made it more mysterious when they did the Baghdad scene where... Um, What's his name again? Ishmael? I can't always forget his name. Iqban? Let me or... find it. I know he used Rashid something. <coughs> Mohammed Rashid something something. He used to say. Uh, Ahmed Ibn Fal- Faldan. Okay, Ahmed. Iban. Ahmed. 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 Yeah. Ahmed, basically. I would have loved if they had gone to the ancient Baghdad sort of thing, and sort of started there for the first 20 minutes or so, and then him going off to uh, being punished uh, and saying, okay, you better go off to these places or we'll jail you or kill you, whatever, or threaten him. And he's been doing this position out of favour by the sultan to this multi-millionaire or influential person or whatever he may have been. And build that story up from there, and then done something similar on the Viking side where they did 10 15 minutes on their side. What they were doing that part of uh, the river at the same time as uh, yeah. the Rusks or whoever it was who was after um, the Mongols after the Arabs in the middle, sort of thing. But they didn't do or, any of that, or, yeah. or even even had Ahmed shagging that, that woman, the yeah, Sultan's been- wife. Exactly, that would have been interesting yeah. as well. And then yeah. you'd be like, "Oh, right, I get it." Mm. Yeah, yeah, because that, you know, just catching eye contact with someone there's hardly a reason to be banished. Mm, yeah, it was more than that. It was basically put in a polite way. Yeah, uh, that's all. But too polite. I think even if it was just a scene in bed with both of them naked, they don't have to be have a full sex scene. But you know, giving the impression they had sex would have been enough to sort of build that up. Him jumping bit, out of uh, the sort of shutters, old a bit like the yeah yeah, you know, just yeah. leaping out of the window. Uh, yeah yeah shit. yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just cupping his balls. Oh shit! Yeah. Yes. <laughs> a bit like the um, the Viking woman as well, the blonde Viking woman. I yeah. mean that was. Um, I mean that was something, wasn't it? I mean, how would that that would have been interesting to have gone into? You've got this yes. Nordic, you know, this Nordic Scandinavian blonde woman meeting this um guy from Iraq and getting together. That would have been interesting. But I think I mean even Matey Boy asked him, said, you know, so did you? And he was like, oh, we don't talk about such things in my country. You know, fair enough. You know, fair enough respect. But come on. Boy, did he? Boy, you want to know, didn't you? Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Exactly. It was just, kind it was of just like holding the hands. Come, come with me. You, if it looked, the scene was like, uh, I'll keep you warm at night. You know, I'm like your grandmother. Sleep next to me. You know, like he was <laughs> a child. There's a sort of thing you they've know, done, haven't they? My grandmother really? never would have done that. No, no. But you know what I'm saying. <laughs> like I'm, I'm your, I'm your, I'm your best friend, female friend. I'm going to protect you. Let's cover ourselves, and I'll hug you. That's what what I'm saying. It was the yeah, impression a, wasn't that. Uh. There's a bit that you know we're talking about that that um, that woman. There's a bit on there that I remember where he's riding off to go on that mission to yeah. go right into the into the heart into the the cave and, and kill them. And um, as he's riding off, she brushes her fingers across his boot as he's on the horse, yeah. like she was marking him or something. I was expecting that to be some kind of, you know, like protection symbol or some sort of rune that she just sort of slapped yeah. on him to keep him uh, to keep him safe and whatnot. And yeah, mm-hmm. but nothing. It was never explained. Um, that just yeah. went by the by. Yeah, but it's definitely. Definitely a troubled film. This, uh, and not only that, but you know where he was. Meant to, one of the the guys was meant to be on a tower, look for a lookout. He suddenly had a zippo going from the tree oh, to zip, the yeah, the zip line. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize they had that sort of metal at the time because he had. If you looked at it here, it, it felt like a metal sort of a uh, modern, oh, like a sort steel of, twined cable. Yeah, yeah. it probably thought, was. You know, just hoping people was. didn't pick up on it. Yeah. Yeah, I thought they've ruined it. I suppose, I mean, do you understand why? 
that was there from a tactical perspective. Yeah, he was. It was higher, and he was sort of uh, making sure it was uh, sort of disguised so they couldn't see him, could they? In the exactly. tower, yeah. yeah. So you, the first place you'd look is the tower, um, yeah. but he's hiding in the tree. Of course, but yeah. that, that zip line would give it away, though. I mean, if you're slowly cantering on a horse, you look yeah. up, and you go, "Oh, what's that fucking? Oh, I see. There's somebody in the tree. You might kill him." Yeah, <laughs> and not only that, that guy looked like something out of Robin Hood, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, did he survive? Yeah, he survived. Uh, there was only two, quite, I think there was three of them or four of them died, didn't they? Yeah, two of them died at the start, and then one of them died in the second one, dark scene, where he got shot by arrows in the back five or six times, then he turned around and got another six in, in his uh, chest and stomach and dies, and then gets his mm-hmm. head chopped off at the same time when he's dying. Uh, and they take it... Um, to take the head with him because when he enters that witch's cave, he sees his friends, uh, two or three of his friends, uh, yeah. heads. Yeah, yeah. If I went in a cave and I saw my friends, oh, I'm going, Oh, hello, mate. How you doing? You all right? You just said your head off, uh, have you? Oh, yeah. Turn around and just say, uh, Right, I'm out of here. Yeah, same. <laughs> Fuck. Fuck that. I'm not going any further. <laughs> no. I don't care who you are. You know, you... <laughs> <laughs> if you're carrying a big sword or an axe or something, now forget it. I'm I'm not going in now. <laughs> See, this is this is the thing I find fascinating about Viking movies. The impression they give, like even Roman movies, that these people were so brave they weren't scared of anything. Come on, there were folklores that these people were scared of. You're telling me they weren't going to be scared of uh, some person uh, with like cave with skeleton skulls and actual heads with full flesh on it. This is the sort of things that uh, make me not laugh, but make me go, this is bullshit. Because if they're scared of folk tales, then they're going to be scared of that. 110%. Mm. I might be wrong, but... Well, you know, it's a film, isn't it? (laughs) Yes, true. But then again, I know that Scandinavians are, or the Nordic people are, tough nuts as well. Um, One thing I know, they're heavy drinkers. Um, and they do show that in the movie, uh, and then they don't yeah, feel that, anything. That was actually quite good. That bit, I did, I did quite like that bit where um, um, Bandera's Ahmed is offered to drink. Yeah. At the end, he said, "I cannot drink anything from what is it? Wheat and grapes. That's it. Fermented yeah. grapes. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, due to being a Muslim, and yeah. um, guy just starts laughing. I said, "It's made from honey." <laughs> Yeah, at thing, that point, it's like, oh, thank fuck for that. Right, go on. I'll have, uh, yeah, just give me all of them. I'll have all of them. Yeah, but what about if it's fermented honey which has turned into alcohol? It's the same bloody thing, isn't it? Well, I, I don't know enough about it. I don't know enough about same it in religion. So <laughs> same maybe, here. maybe, or maybe not. Or maybe or maybe you can get pissed up on, on mead. Yeah, I've got no idea myself I, about I don't either think that's things. true. Oh, no. no, that's true. No, but no. Um, yeah, it would be funny if it was. And he's just all right, okay, fine, and just starts knocking it back. Yeah. Five on the go. <laughs> and then he just suddenly faints and uh, falls over in the mud. I'm trying to find some. Um, one interesting good, good was, One thing was good when he, you know, when he, he goes into the last battle, basically, he sort of decides to play. And. What what uh, the music goes really well and what he's saying and I think they do say that in real life uh, when uh, Muslims go into war I don't know what they say but I presume they do and that was quite mysterious to me the way they did it because um, in the Western world we don't see that when uh, soldiers or anyone goes into fights really so I can imagine. I, thousand plus years ago when that happened that might have been quite mysterious going what what is this guy doing but the funny thing was a yeah. norwegian guy or the scandinavian guy knew what he was doing and started doing the same thing sort of play or saying certain words yeah we're all heathens now aren't we we're all godless in the west no we have no religion anymore no gods we're just atheists anarchic Nihilists. <laughs> <laughs> That's why our culture is just rapidly declining. 
Anyway, moving on to something else. Um, <laughs> no um, political messages, and then. <laughs> so we mentioned this was a box office flop. And I'm just going to. Yeah. This is a bit of trivia that I found here, and this might seem a bit like um, retroactive cope. But although rumours persist that this was one of the most expensive movie flops ever, with a budget of 160 million, the producers claimed it actually cost 90 million before marketing. The movie grossed 32 million in the US and 61 million worldwide. So they're claiming that it's not as bad as it was. But if it cost 90 million before marketing, and then all the other movie fact sites are saying it is 160 million, that is a shitload of marketing for a film that until you mentioned it, I've never fucking heard of. Really? Haven't you? I thought you would have watched it. I. I, well, actually, that's, that's not entirely true, actually. I did a, after we watched Northman, I then did, um, or just before we watched The Northman and did the review, I did a, a, a look up on Viking movies because I thought, you know, I'm quite into this at the moment. So hmm. I thought I'd look up a bunch of Viking movies and then I'd, I'd get them all and over a period of time I'd watch them. And The 13th Warrior came up then. So I was briefly aware of it. And then you mentioned it and then I did the research and eventually watched it. So until well, then. Not a fucking clue. Well, it was funny because uh, you say that because I really didn't go and watch this, but it was one of our friends, uh, ex friends, I should say now, uh, who mentioned it to me a uh, long time ago when it came out. Yeah, when it came out, because you have to watch this from here. And I thought, yeah, it's another action movie, it'll be shit. And then I, it was, I remember one night, it was probably about 10 or 11, it was on. And yeah, it was just starting. I thought, okay, I'm going to stay awake and watch it. And as I said, first time I watched it and the second time I really liked it. Uh, really enjoyed it. But today, well, I watched all of it virtually uh, last night, but last 10 minutes I watched today. I really felt short change. As I said, so much things could have been built up on and it could have been a much better movie. It looks like They've rushed into uh, just finishing the project off. And when someone like Omar Sharif says, I'm not going to make this sort of shit anymore and retired, you know. And he was already a washed up um, movie star. Unfortunately, he was one of these guys who was mega in the 60s and probably early 70s. And after that, he, he did movies just for the money. And that's what he did it for because he was a... Uh, a bridge player, international level bridge player, and he, I think he was world champion. So he always needed some money for his own personal life, like because of bridge, and he would get paid highly for little parts like this, like a million or two million dollars a movie like that. And he did loads of them. And when he said, "I've had enough, my reputation has been tarnished, and I'm retiring," and when a washed-up actor says that, you know the movie is shit and it's flopped completely and things have happened in the background that he wasn't happy about. And that's the thing. And it's a shame. Really a shame. Yeah, and there's obviously a lot of um, turbulence with the whole McTean and, and then Crichton takeover. Because yeah. if the film was kind of shot and then Crichton said, no, nah, I don't like this, and then took over and redid loads, loads of sections of it, the reshoots, then... Yeah, you know, there's going to be problems there. It's a bit like you know when we when we talked about Alien Three, yes. you know, a few months back, Jesus. and the fuck ups that happened there, and what a flop that was, Alien Three, and yeah, it seems to be similar. You'd think they'd learn, wouldn't you? Yes. But then I guess you know we're all we're all human, aren't we? We all think that we can try and well, save something. I suppose. I have to say one thing, Paul. Have we learned ever as humans? Think about yeah. all the. Conflicts that have happened in the world will say, Oh, it won't happen next time. And 20 years later, it happened again, as we know in the, in the 20th yeah. century. We never learn. That's True. the problem about human nature. We always think that we'll learn, but we never do. So, here's a little fact for you one of the Viking ships used in the movie is now in the Norwegian Pavilion in the Epcot Center at Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida, where it is used as a playground for kids. Disney owns Touchstone Pictures. Oh, nice. Yeah, so there you go. If, if anyone's planning a holiday to Disney World in Orlando, Florida, you can go and see one of the Viking boats used in this film. I tell you what, the bit 
I find interesting, and I'm sure they cut it uh, in this movie. Is the funeral? I'm sure they showed all of it in the, the at the start. You know where the dame is buried, basically. And I swear they did show that in the full cut before, where you can actually hear a scream and stuff like that because of the fire. And then uh, all right. Hamid is sort of going bloody hell, and he and he's shocked uh, by it. And uh, I think you know the bit I was showing where each bloke. Uh, has a oh uh, well, has sex with the person who's going with the king because that's what the king would want, and they're sort of representing the king. I'm sure it was this movie they showed it in. Are you? I mean, I know what you're talking about vaguely. Are you not think? Have you ever seen the TV series Vikings? I have. I have. I may now, be getting confused with yeah, that as well. I think possibly because very early on, I think in series one, um. Once Ragnar Lothbrok defeats the current Jarl mm. in a in a, in combat, he obviously becomes Jarl. His wife is spared, but there is a, I think it's a female servant or a female slave. That, that, yeah, they all basically you know, group sex and all take it one after the other. And she's drunk and they're plying her with mead and stuff. And then eventually they do. I think they do cut her throat and put her on the put her on the boat it to go with it. Yeah, I think it could be where I'm getting a little bit confused with that and this. Yeah, Yeah. because I I do know vaguely what you were talking about, and I remember seeing something like that, and I I think it was from TV series Vikings, which is an excellent TV series. Yeah. Well, maybe series six ain't so good, but, you know. It starts off, it's like all these, it starts off well and then ends up being shit. I think the problem with the TV series Vikings is that once Travis Fennell, who played (laughs) Ragnar Lothbrok, once he dies... That's it. It's kind of game over. It's like everyone just went, oh, right, okay. Don't really, not really that really bother about watching the rest of it now. Yeah. It's like that Rome. If you remember that that uh, series, Rome, 10, 15 years, 10 years ago or 15 years ago? Yeah, it was like it. that. That Yeah. The first two or three series were were really good. And after that, it started declining. Oh, there's only two. If, if you're thinking about no, the same two? one I am, there's only two series in that. And both of them are fucking excellent. Right, okay, yeah. It must be the same one because I remember watching bits of it. I thought it was free for some reason because I stopped watching it after the first one because I forgot when it was coming on. I, there were so much things at the same time. I'm one of these. I'm terrible. I like watching them. I go halfway through and then I go, okay, first part, first series. So I'm, yeah, yeah. I'll watch the second series. Then I I see it the date and I completely forget and then I like, can't be bothered watching them once they've had four or five episodes or whatever episodes have gone by because then you lose your sort of story but anyway coming back to this movie yeah well uh, coming back to this movie i kind of think i've run out of trivia for it and i've run out of thoughts run out of opinions promotional posters in mexico displayed the film's title as eaters of the dead most theaters never received posters with the new title confusing moviegoers Jeez. so yeah that's where your marketing budget went <laughs> confusing <laughs> pundits yeah, the cave scenes were almost almost filmed on location near the camp set in Elk Bay, but production forced them to film the scenes in a studio in Vancouver, in a large stage called the A Frame, measuring ten thousand square meters. And it was two hundred meters long, fifty meters wide, and twenty meters tall. Hmm. Well, there's another thing about that scene. Do you know how dangerous it is cave diving? Mm. they didn't have a rope and they managed to find the way out into the open sea um, yeah that was well they, they knew that they were taking a chance of that they could die but rather die there than they would have been getting all these um, strange people stabbing them up but True. yes I, yeah but wasn't that like top that there was a, for a waterfall wasn't it and then they said oh yeah, there must be a way out because this is at the top of the mountain and the way. And anyway, yeah, um, a huge gamble to get out of that. I certainly wouldn't do it. I would. No. I'd say fuck that. I'd. I'd rather be stabbed and, and carved up and have my head taken off. At least it'd be fairly quick and fairly yes. painless. Whereas drowning, it's painful. Yeah, fuck that. People. Well, even when people have been saved. 
like well, from drowning, they've said that's been one of the most painful experiences because you can't breathe properly and stuff like that. So that is a horrible way to die. Uh, yeah, yeah I panic. agree with you. Yeah, it's panic, o- le- lack of oxygen in your body and mm. all that. I agree with you. I'll either sort of go down fighting it with a sword, getting stabbed a hundred times, arrow, bow and arrows being shot at me in, in my back, and then if they chop my head off, fine. Game set and match to them. It's over. Fine, if you're happy with that, would you? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> if I had a choice which way to die, I'd rather not drown because they, 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 that's horrible. But I'd rather go yeah. down as a brave soldier, if you get what I'm saying. I, I don't want to die anyway. I think no one wants to die, but uh, I'm talking about in the context of the uh, contact of a uh, contact. Well, I can't even say it now within the movie, if you get what I'm saying. <laughs> Fucking hell, I can't, I can't speak. To you. Should, we, um, should we score it? Yeah, sure. I'll let you go first. Okay. Yes. I'm giving this a five. Um, I, it's just kind of a... I can't go any lower than that because I, I struggle to go lower than a four or a five because I don't think that's fair. You know, there's obviously a lot... I always think about the logistics involved. The, I mean, there was hundreds of people there as well. Can you imagine that was extras and stuff and that, you know, one of them was trying to have a crafty cigarette on camera. Like, oh, you fucking stop smoking. You know, someone's trying to eat a cheese sandwich. It's like, fucking, yeah, you've had lunch. All that, all the management and the organisation of it all and stuff, and that you've got to give some credit. Or well, someone wearing a watch, which is from the twentieth century, yeah. going, "Hey, mate!" <laughs> Someone's texting on their Nokia thirty three ten. Will you fucking cut it out? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> stop doing that. Yeah. Can I? So well, basically, I think you and I—I I don't know what it is. Last week we did the same score, and I was thinking the same this week as well. Five. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're in sync. I, I, yeah, we're in sync. Uh, I agree with you. There's all that stuff you've mentioned. The reason why I'm going at five, it did not build up to what it could have been. There could, as I said, there could have been really good story in there to start with. Twenty or thirty minutes, or in the in uh, Baghdad, saying what happened to this guy, and then same with the Vikings. I tell you, the best bit of the movie was, and it was a little bit touching because it reminds of our, you know, close friendships that we have. Was in the end when they were saying goodbye. I felt that was the best bit of the movie. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for coming. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, thanks for helping, mate. You see around soon. Might see you soon. Never know. (laughs) Uh, Um, And why he 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 goes back and he, he writes. He's writing the book or whatever. In the end, mm. um, yeah, I thought of something. Now that was it. Yes, I, I kind of wish I'd done a little bit more research on the whole John McTiernan and Michael Crichton transfer, because I'm wondering what would have happened if Crichton hadn't got involved yeah. and just let McTiernan get on with it and say, right, I, I hate this, I hate this version, mate. This is shit. I don't. This is not my vision. But let's roll with it. I wonder if it would have been a better film. I agree, yeah. Sometimes too many chiefs, not enough yeah. Indians can spoil the sort of uh, end product. Yeah. So, maybe. yeah. But yeah, um, that was the be- uh, best bit of the movie when they were saying goodbye. Oh, I, that's sorry, I, think, but... I think maybe for me it might have been the, the, the little fight in the village, the big guy, and... Um, the, uh, the other character that was there for comedic effect. No. I think um, that little battle where he just let himself pretty much get... What happened to that? That's, you know, that's just something that reminded me of. There was like a second in command from the king of that village or the leader at the, the Yarl of that village. There was like a second in command. Oh, his son, the prince. Yeah. What, what, what happened to him? He disappeared. But not after yeah. that scene, he never... Yeah, yeah. Because after that fight scene where his kind of champion got killed, he just gets the ump, walks off, swings his sword a bit because he's pissed off, and that's it. You never fucking see him again. No, I don't know if his father said, "Okay, mate, your champion's lost. Piss off. Go go away." Uh, well, got, you... That that has to have been lost in the whole John McTiernan and Michael Crichton transfer. That has definitely been. Yes, there must have something must have happened. 
Mm. Something must have happened. Yeah. As I said, it could have been great. I reckon it could have been a could have, yeah, I reckon it could have been an interesting character that I tried, that I carried on. Yeah. Anyway, should we, uh, should we leave it there? Because I don't think I've got anything yeah. else to say about this. No. No, the same here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we managed to drag it out for fifty minutes, so that's not too bad. Fifty minute thought, movie review of the thirteenth warrior. I thought we were finishing twenty minutes of the way we we, we yeah. sort of were started off and thought, Yeah, know. I did. Yeah, yeah. It's about twenty five minutes in, I looked at the count, I looked at the clock and was like, Oh shit, oh, we've got to pad this one out. We can't we can't <laughs> do this for twenty five minutes. Um yeah. All I, all I would say, if anyone's watching us and uh, does watch us, go and watch it yourself and uh, sort of make comments and tell us what you think of your, uh, give us your feedback because you might think, wow, this is amazing what these guys are talking about. Or you may say, yeah, I agree with them, uh, or whatever the case may be. Or you can say, oh, that, you two are knobs. This was a really brilliant movie. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, everyone has their own opinions. There's certain things that even as friends, we won't agree on so yeah please do and come and sort of put a comment etc so i would i would say that you must hate our audience samir because in my opinion this is an hour and 43 minutes that you could do without wasting watching this film it's not there's nothing <laughs> really to take there's nothing to take from this film that's no. poignant in any way memorable in any way even stirs any kind of emotion there's nothing. This is just it falls completely flat. You can see what they're trying to do. Yeah. It just isn't done very well. That's why I think the goodbye bit was the best bit because that brought a little <laughs> bit of emotion into me because I would imagine I would be quite sad if I was leaving my friends, sort of thing. Um, and I would probably, if I was a writer, I would probably write yeah, uh, write something. Yeah, we we had great venture like this or whatever. So that was a little bit. Uh, that was the only bit. That I had little emotion. Otherwise, everything else was wow. Okay, he's chopped the other guy's head off. He stabbed him through his uh, bare skin. Wow, amazing, yeah. marvelous. Well, to sum up, saying that this this was a shame. Um, yes, it had, it had potential, and I do think that I would like to have seen the John McTiernan version. Put it that way. Yeah. Michael Crichton, you write the book, mate. Fair enough. Source material is yours, but yeah. Fuck off, mate. Let's just see what we can do with this. So, okay, well, thanks for joining us on that little journey. Um, sorry it wasn't particularly informative and interesting, but there you go. Not everything can be, can it? Um, if you liked it, like, give us a like, you know, subscribe if you want to subscribe or don't, whatever. Who gives a shit anymore? We do this for our entertainment, not yours. <laughs> 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 So um, you can find us all over the place, social media and stuff like that. You know, we can, we put posts out of what we're doing, what we're doing next, what films we're doing next. Um, and we'll inform you fairly soon of what we plan to do next. So it's goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Bye. <laughs>